When we were organizing the speakers and the moderator and the chairmen, and uh, I was told, okay, I have to moderate or chair the session. Uh, first of all, really, I said, well, His Excellency Nabil Fahmi is uh, a prominent diplomat and uh, highly sought of academic. So what I'm doing here, so I said, I better do my homework, just in case. And when I'm doing my homework and researching the net about Nabil, I came across something where I asked him to give me latitude. I came across Ismail Fahmi, his father, His Excellency, the late Ismail Fahmi, who was a minister for foreign affairs in Egypt from 73 to 77. And there is something really, uh, I stopped that. Uh, when President Sadat announced his visit to Israel, Ismail Fahmi wrote the following. I believe it would harm Egypt, national security. It will damage our relation with the Arab countries and destroy our leadership of the Arab world. Well, two sentences have three powerful words, harm, damage, destroy. Either you agree or disagree with the, the value of such a statement, that's not the issue. The issue is a question of principle for Ismail Fahmi, as when the visit took place, to my living memory, he probably the only foreign minister who resigned in Egypt, modern history, on principle. After that, he joined the Luft party as a member of parliament for Egypt in 1984. That takes us to Nabil, and you can see a lot of the DNA have passed along. He is a very prominent diplomat who served as Egypt ambassador in Japan, then served for two subsequent terms as our ambassador in the United States. He had a bachelor degree of science, and wait for it, it was in physics and mathematics, two of the most difficult subjects, really, uh, to study, or at least to me, that's why I became a doctor. <laughs> Then he accepted to be a foreign minister in Biblawi government. And he was saying to me, he insisted that his first foreign visit was to Sudan. So it just shows us how the man think and how he want to polarize uh, the foreign policy of Egypt during this difficult time. He got his honorary PhD from the Monterey Institute at Middlebury in, 20, in 2009. Nabil also is the founder and the dean of the School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the American University. Nabil will take us through a beautiful journey, uh, a century of politics. He will talk about the 1919, its strengths, its shortfall, and how really it led to subsequent three revolutions to follow 
in one century. Without any further ado, I would like to introduce His Excellency Nabil Fahmi, and after that, we'll have a question and answer session. Thank you very much, Dr. Hanna. That was very nice of you. Uh, I'd like to thank the three hosts of this event. I think it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity for me to be back in London, Brexit or not. Uh, but it's also an opportunity to come here on a very important and momentous occasion, which is the centennial of the 1919 revolution in Egypt, with everything that it holds uh, for us and its very important place in history. Before getting into my speech, however, I want to issue a personal uh, uh, expression of gratitude to James Watt. James is an old, a friend of long standing. When you, when you get on in age, you use that term rather than old. Uh, but also a very uh, acknowledged and talented diplomat. And I've had many, many occasions to, to engage with him in the past. And uh, we've been able to move things forward and manage things where we disagreed in a very civilized and uh, constructive fashion. So thank you, James, for uh, suggesting that I come here. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm both a practitioner, I'm actually more a practitioner than an academic or a politician although I've, I argue that I've actually been a practitioner in all three of them at uh, different periods of time. Because of that, I'm very careful about looking at history and how I use, how I assess, and then how I use uh, my conclusions of historical events. I will admit that on many occasions, I've used what I found useful to serve policies or arguments that I was putting forward. But when I put my leg into the other side of the story, the more academic part of the story, then I become a bit more careful in uh, drawing conclusions. So I come to you today a bit hesitant. I don't like to assess things so far back. It's not only because I may not know all the facts. Uh, if you're a serious historian, you can do rigorous work and get as many facts as you want. But it's because assessing isn't only about facts. It's not about hard assets. It's about a lot of intangibles. Uh, what's the context of these decisions? What, how are the decisions taken? What was expected uh, at the time? And therefore, I made it a point to use the word polity rather than the word politics uh, in the title of my speech, because for me, polity made the whole context of the body politique of what was happening. And yes, it's useful to, to assess from afar because you can be objective. But at the same time, and I can tell you from my own personal experience, occasionally one looks back and sees everything as flowery and wonderful because the situation you're passing through at a point of time is challenging. And you can look back and hold those events to standards that you've set now that didn't exist then, and then un unfairly judge those events in an unfair fashion. So I just wanted to make that point because I think any historical analysis and evaluation needs to be done with the respect of context. And the context may be different, so let's do these things a bit cautiously. To focus my discussion today, I'm going to refer to basically four events. Focus is going to be 1919, but let me throw four events at you. 1919, revolution in Egypt, which resulted in the independence from Britain, the establishment of a constitution and a political system that did not exist prior to that. 1952 revolution, which shifted from a monarchy to Republic, among other things. The January 25th, 2011, where we, hit, we witnessed a contemporary revolutionary awakening, although, and it ended in uh, Mohammed Hosni Mubarak's end of term, and then we moved on and in June and July 2013 to 
uh, a situation where Mohamed Morsi, the elected president at the time, was removed. Now, I tend to use terms carefully, and you'll understand why I describe each one of these a bit differently, or at least the, the last two. Since 1919, or actually 1919, the first of the four, it was unique because it was basically, initially, a call, a, a call for the rejection of foreign rule. That's how it started. Uh, the subsequent movements in Egypt, the other three, tended to be initially of domestic interest rather than of international interest, although the international uh, dimension also came in quite quickly. There is, however, a common element in all four. All four of these events were a call for freedom. And I argue that 1919 was the, be the beginning of a century of a call for freedom in Egypt. And in many ways, um, with the achievements and disappointments, these four events tend to be uh, connected in, in one way or the other. Again, being torn between practice and academia, uh, one tends to define revolutions only as a success if they actually, actually, only as revolutions, if they actually change political structures and or political practices. Uh, the standard set in 1919, however, which was not met in all the other cases, was a very high standard. At the same time, I argue that the achievement of 1919, which cannot be belittled, did not conclude successfully because it was not sustained. And therefore, the emergence of three other events were in, were in effect a result of that. If you look at from 1919 to 2011, the major structures in Egypt were a monarchy and four presidents. 100 years, 92 years. From 2011 to 2019, eight years, we've had four presidents. So, and actually, if you drop the last four, you, even in, the, in those four years, you just have four presidents. Since 1919, Egyptian polity has gone through incremental progressions forward, as well as numerous regressions backward, as the body politic tries to find the center of gravity, tries to find where exactly it's comfortable with. And the irony of that, or the reason for that, is that we've tried to define political aspirations of the people according to the political system at the time. What could the system cope with? When in actual fact, the political system should be defined by what the aspirations are. And since we haven't been able to bridge that gap, we've had these continuous uh, issues of, of progressions and regressions. I think one of the things that are extremely important about 1919 also is its composition. It initially started by the liberal elite, but was immediately, very, very quickly, supported by many, many more people of different categories, not only in the urban areas, but also in the rural areas. And it started as an, a, a struggle for independence, but nevertheless, was a, or possibly because of that, was able to evolve in a process where Muslims, Christians, people of no faith, a rich, poor, a leftist, rightist, Islamists, all found reason to accommodate themselves in spite of their different opinions uh, on many, many contentious issues. There were problems. There were disagreements. But the ultimate result is that Egyptians were able to come together uh, and that's why I actually, and, I, and the title of this, of this uh, two-day event is very important. 1919 did not only succeed in creating structures 
that by which Egypt would be governed. It did not only succeed in establishing a constitution. Uh, the process itself, as I said, brought the people together. But I think most importantly, 1919 helped establish the national identity of Egypt, which governed who we felt we were for many, many decades thereafter. The content of the, of the Constitution then was basically a very inclusive Constitution. It involved everybody, uh, and everybody had the same rights as citizens within that national identity, irrespective of whatever faith, gender, political inclination you had. And I can go on and give you examples and details of different parties, whether it's Hezbo Islah, the National Reform Party, the, the People's Party, the Weft Party, uh, they all had, and I would add to them, Islamist parties as well, they all had different inclinations. But they felt that the national identity of Egypt was one that they could work within and pursue whatever objectives they may have uh, at, at a later point. And this pull factor, in spite of the fact that it was initially started by liberals who took uh, the issue of independence as the primary catalyst and who took liberalism concepts from Europe, much more than from the Middle East, as their core. But they were able to use those elements because of the inclusive nature and, get, and gather Egyptians generally around them. Now, it wasn't only, by the way, something that was purely of Egyptian context. It was about Egypt, Egyptian independence. But at the time, you saw other Arab countries in the Middle East asking to be recognized in the process of what's happening in Egypt. That happened from Syrian politicians. It happened in the Sudanese revolution in Iraq and in the Palestinians. They all referred to what's happening in Egypt and consequently wanted to pursue, again, the same independence posture. So the implications of that revolution regionally, way before there was the internet or social networks or, frankly, television, the implications then were much wider than uh, one tends to appreciate now. Another point to take into account in the Egyptian context, like any healthy society, we always like to disagree. Uh, and there are different assessments of the 19 revolution in Egypt today. But I find very few people actually find it to be something that was detrimental to Egypt. I actually don't know any who do. I know some who will argue that it was not as successful as one claims. Others who will argue that it was more successful than one could have expected, given that we were colonized at the time. But if you compare it to the other three events I mentioned, this actually continues to have, 100 years later, a lot more support, a lot more positive uh, um, response or commentary on it than any one of the other three, irrespective of what was right and what was not. But my critique to 1919 is with all of its marvelous achievements, if it had established a sustained, and it established a pluralistic uh, political system, but had it achieved a pluralistic political culture, it would have been much more sustainable than it was, than, than, than we actually seen. Now again, I'm moving rather quickly here, but historians will tell you of examples of problems, including British involvement in trying to put a cap on this trend, and specifically on trying to draw differences and arguments between the different Egyptian parties, 
uh, interpretations of the Constitution adopted at the time, uh, encouraging the king to play uh, not a sovereign role, but much more of an executive role, and consequently, and the Constitution did at the time allow him to play a significant role. So there were problems, and there were difficulties. By the 1940s, you could read into the environment in Egypt at the time that people were starting to complain about we achieved freedom, but we didn't achieve equanimity, or at least aren't treated equally. Uh, and again, talk started to emerge about corruption, uh, especially the influence of the monarchy on the system, and so on and so forth. Slowly, that talk moved towards, okay, how do we act on these things? In other words, other revolutions. And that's really the beginning of the, um, the process in, until you, we reach in 1952. As I said, do not underestimate what happened in 1919 because of the fundamental structural change that occurred in Egypt, including in institution making, but more importantly, what it did in terms of defining what Egypt, what Egyptians thought they should be. And the, one of the strongest uh, tests, if you want, Egyptians were trying to, or were complaining, that practice was not commensurate with the content of the constitution itself. So they weren't actually comparing themselves with another country. They were saying that this is not the, the, the practice that we expected to get with this constitution. And that's what led up to the crisis ultimately with the, with the king, uh, with King Farouk in 1952. Now, the 1952 events, about the Nasser and the free officers, basically picked up the social agenda, the issue of social justice as the core of their message. It wasn't initially about a foreign power. It was basically about disparities inside Egypt itself. And both the issue and the personalities, particularly Nasser, were very attractive issues to population as a whole. Uh, it gained support very quickly, but as it gained support very quickly, both inside and outside Egypt, the form of government moved from a more liberal, pluralistic system to one that was much more central, uh, focused on a strong hand of government, and as the years went by, the concept of liberalism slowly started to erode in our system. And I would argue that 1952 was caused by the lack of sustainability in 1919. But in actual fact, it didn't build on 1919 to move further towards the objectives of the Constitution in the 1920s, uh, but rather the other way around. And again, the 1952 was initially domestically driven. It did not come from the liberal elite. It came from the military. And it was basically focused on a social class. It was the beginning of the slow erosion, as I mentioned, of the liberal system and, if you want, even a, uh, more, a tighter uh, context for pluralistic, for pluralistic cu political culture. Um, Anwar Sadat, who succeeded Nasser, he, everybody talks about his foreign policy positions, but they ignore his domestic positions. In actual fact, he started, or he, he, he once again opened the door for a multi-party system in Egypt. First by what we called manaber, or if you want, platforms or podiums, and then ultimately parties. Uh, but that being said, and to be fair, while he encouraged the number of parties that emerged, he was not, again, 
personally purely committed, uh, for, uh, fully committed to pluralistic politics, which basically means people have the right to share power, people have the right to hold you accountable, um, besides expecting uh, the efficient management of public goods and services. So I would argue that while Sadat's uh, years in office were softer in terms of practice than Nasser's in terms of politics, and while he did open the door for the, the emergence of the of political parties, including the return of the Welsh Party, by the way, uh, he himself fell back into his own regression. And less than a few weeks before he was assassinated, he actually put all of his opposition in, in prison at the same time, left, right, and center, which is not no the normal uh, thing you would do. Uh, Mubarak came in after Sadat and spent 30 years in office. First step, first number of years were actually marvelous. First thing he did was release everybody in prison, all the politicians from prison. Second thing he, he tried to do, important thing, I mean, there were many, many things, was, okay, let's recenter Egypt in the middle of the Arab world so we can manage our regional context properly and gain the benefit of uh, our context. That being said, and both Sadat and Mubarak, by the way, initially with Sadat, continued with Mubarak, allowed for the return of the Islamists, the Muslim Brotherhood, into the political party system. There is no question that the Mubarak era was more open than eras before it, since the beginning of the Republic. Uh, was it a Western European democracy? No. But you could express your opinion on many, many things until you sort of hit the wall. Uh, and that was not necessarily frequent, but it happened. Uh, there were maybe uh, former parliamentarians in the room here can, can correct, my, correct me, but there were over 100 parties in Egypt. I can't name seven, frankly, of them. But there are over 100 parties, or were over 100 parties, that started with Sadat and went through uh, with Mubarak. And he did not use, he wasn't rough with on opinion issues. So I could argue that 30 years, there was a lot more room to discuss. And what I'm focusing here on is political discussions. The economic discussions and the sort, that went to much higher and, and wider level. But I'm basically talking about the issue that we deal with when we talk about democracy, which basically political discussions. So I would argue that Mubarak actually left a lot more room for a much longer period of time. But to be credible, he had a much longer period of time as well. So one would have argued that given that time, he should have been more successful than Sadat or even Nasser in creating, if he truly believed in this, in creating a political culture in Egypt that respected a, a, a multipolar uh, political culture. And that, frankly, did not happen. I would argue that we had a multi-party system, but one that was artificial. And if I challenge anybody here who can name 20 of the parties that existed at the time, and that's just one example, uh, and all of you here are interested in Egyptian politics, including myself, and that's the point I'm making. I think that Mubarak gave a lot more room for people to work, but on establishing a political democracy, there was quite a way to go. Uh, 2011. I used to live 100 yards from Tahrir Square. So I could not only see what was happening, I could smell it, I could hear it. I was not an activist, simply an Egyptian interested in what's happening. And what happened in 2011 basically started with very limited ambitions. It started on police day because it was, it was a reflection of anger against the police. And there were specific incidents that they referred to where they wanted better uh, police practices. And then they wanted 
amendments to the Constitution to ensure that you had a more democratic system. But this was a grassroots system, grassroots emergence. Uh, again, I don't call it a revolution only because I'm an academic now, but as somebody in the street, I would call it a revolution. I think it was a revolutionary awakening by any standard. And the only real point where you can uh, determine whether it was a revolution or not is the long-term effects of it. But anyway, more importantly, this was grassroots, no leaders, no, no precise goal to change structures. The precise goal was to simply get better police practices and ensure some transfer of power in the future. Uh, it quickly emerged into something much larger, but it also had another problem. If you assume that in 1919, these were the political elite, and in 1952, this was a, Egyptians from the military who had political views, but worked within a structured system, well, 2011, they were neither that nor that. They didn't have a, a fixed system through which they would channel their efforts efficiently, nor, frankly, did they represent either experienced politicians or uh, military. So this was truly a grassroots if, uh, uh, step that started. Um, one that did not have a defined goal that was major, but as the days went on, the goal expanded and the numbers increased. And I argue that the core of this group were centrist youth, irrespective of who, at, who joined them later or who tried to take advantage of them. That's not uh, unique to 2011. Uh, but I still think that while I'm not ready to academically define them as a revolution, I, do, I think one should not underestimate the context and the importance of the awakening that happened then, and therefore I will use the term revolutionary awakening uh, quite comfortably. If you listen to, if you visit Egypt today, you'll sense what I'm talking about. Because everybody wants a better situation. Whether it's the 2011 youth, whether it is the old guard before 2011, whether it is the middle class, or frankly, whether it is those who are in power. Everybody feels that the system is not efficient enough. Uh, they will have different degrees of criticism but in actual fact, the idea that governments are supposed to provide in an efficient, fair fashion public goods and services, and that individuals have rights of citizenship, are issues being debated in Egypt today, although we haven't reached yet the level where we would like to reach. My conclusions are actually quite simple. All of these revolutions, starting with 1919, all of these events, starting with 1919, are inter intermittent progressions or regressions. Uh, they 1919 hasn't finished yet, nor have any of the others. If we were to have a sustainable structure, as well as a sustainable political culture, of a, a pluralistic political culture, then I would tell you that 1919 has succeeded. But that you cannot argue that because we haven't reached that point yet, that 1919 was not successful or that it did not have a historic context. And I would argue that among the four events I mentioned, uh, I don't doubt at all that in terms of the word revolution, I think 1919 is the one that most strongly corresponds to the definition of revolutions. I would argue that 1952 would be the second in line in that respect, 
irrespective of whether you agreed with 1919 or 1952, because it did change the structures. Uh, I would not underestimate or belittle the importance of 2011, but it, has not, it did not result in a structural change. And therefore, I add the, uh, the word awakening after uh, revolutionary rather than simply stop at revolutions. And what happened in 2013 onwards? Well, I won't debate when the Muslim Brotherhood or the Islamists uh, got engaged on 2011. They were not initially behind it, as I said. It was about centrist youth, uh, like any smart political organization. They jumped at the opportunity uh, when they saw a vacuum, a vacuum created most of all by the erosion of liberal, of liberal politics four or five decades before that. Uh, so what happened was you had youth on the ground, and even the more senior liberal politicians in Egypt had not practiced pluralistic politics for generations. So there was nobody really there to pick up on um, the aspirations of 2011, and the Brotherhood, which were the most efficient, immediately jumped in. Um, why did 2013 happen? I've always believed in freedom of speech, freedom of faith, you name it. You can think and express yourself any way you want. Within the Constitution, sure, every country has to have its rules uh, and procedures, but in essence, I'm sure some people back home don't like my views, but they have to cope with the fact that I'm as, as Egyptian as anybody else. And that's the same context that I apply, frankly, with the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, if they were Brits, I'd send them back to you, by the way. Uh, but they're not. They're Egyptians. They're Egyptians. So, but what's the problem? The problem for me, even for somebody who is, is a strong believer in differences of view, the problem really is, is that for the Brotherhood, Egypt is part of the Ummah. For me, the Brotherhood is part of Egypt. So it comes into an issue of identity. Is the Ummah the identity, or is it Egypt the identity? Uh, as I said, were they to accept a place in the system, but accept the national identity of the country, then they would have found much more resonance. They wouldn't have acted the way they did, by the way, and they would have found much more resonance than they did. Once you start projecting the country that it's part of something larger than your national identity, which was, read, was defined clearly in 1919, has historical background, but what, in 1919, that's really where the problem was. So 2013, I don't really, it, it did not change structures. It changed direction. It was a recorrection of direction. So, uh, and it did have wide-ranging support, but it didn't really result in a change of the system of government. But strangely enough, if you look at these four events, leading up to each one of them, if you could do what you guys like to do here, which is analyze things objectively at arm's length, five or 10 years before each one of them, you would have concluded that this event is inevitable. Whether it was 1919, 1952, 2011, or 2013. Uh, my concluding remark, I think 1919 will remain a historical uh, landmark in Egyptian history uh, that is not challenged, or is, 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 you cannot challenge credibly. I think it has had uh, a much larger impact on national identity than any other event in uh, contemporary Egyptian history. It was, and everything after it, all the polity after it, was a call for freedom and which remains an aspiration we strive for in Egypt today. Thank you very much. Well, this
Mr. Thank you very much for such a beautiful trip. And uh, I'm sure you raised uh, quite a few issues which will raise uh, considerable questions. And uh, I take the view that uh, the 1919, while you accepted, have basically established independent, created a parliament, and uh, a beautiful constitution in 1923. Uh, but however, it has failed to create pluralistic culture and multi-party systems uh, which was practiced for a short period in Egypt till the 1952. The people may take the view that the strong hand of Nasser regime have really killed any hope of a multi-political uh, party system. Uh, and they have gone deliberately to eradicate such uh, polarity within the Egyptian society. However, uh, it is a view. Uh, you raised that the 1911 was revolutionary awakening in, sorry, revolutionary awakening in academic sense and not a revolution. Uh, maybe we will take some different view. So as we have a 15 minute for questions, I, may I take, uh, may I use my prerogative as chairman to ask you a simple question. There was two men during this period and this, they were cont contemporary to each other, Mustafa Kamal and Saad Zaghloul. And both they were liberal. Uh, both studied law, but Mustafa Kamil really took the view of the rise of the uh, caliphates, and he believed in it, particularly after the failure of the Ottoman Empire, and Saad Zaghloul took completely different view. Why one man succeeded and the other have not got a grip during that period in Egypt? Well. Let me just first comment on your introduction. Uh, what I said was 1919, in my mind, succeeded in many, many ways, but its successes were not sustainable. And that's, which is specifically the sustained multi party political culture, that didn't, was not sustainable. And that's what led to 1952. So you can, one can blame. 1952 on, uh, with a lot of things. But the culture didn't exist. I mean, 52 actually occurred because the culture didn't exist, not it didn't cancel the culture. I was very, uh, very open in saying we moved in the opposite direction rather than moving forward in that direction. The other point, uh, I think it's, again, I think it's important to, rather than trying to judge one success, success of one leader or the other, look at the context. 1919 started with, we want independence from the Brits. We want to attend the uh, peace conference. That brought Egyptians together. Uh, and ultimately, the polity, the success or failure of one politician versus the other is a function of who can uh, deal with the context as a whole. Uh, I would argue that the ability, I mean, first of all, the, the sense of politics is important. The sense, that there's one of my mentors many, many years ago told me, never make the best the enemy of the good. And he was a very ambitious person and he actually got the Nobel Prize. So it's not somebody who was not creative. But my point really here is politicians in particular have to stand on principle 
but know when and how to compromise without violating principle. It's not about getting 100% of your result, but it's not also about, for the sake of remaining in power, you drop your principle and move on. So I would argue uh, context differs, uh, different uh, constituencies uh, respond, and also the practices of each politician is an important issue here. Well, thank you very much. Now, I, 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 I'll open the question to the floor. Uh, please make your question concise and don't make a statement, please. Uh, please, can you introduce yourself? My name is Abdullah Humuda. I'm an Egyptian journalist, editor of timesofegypt.com. Uh, by any measure, if any in intellectual discourse uh, valued on the basis of not only providing information but raising question, I, I think you have succeeded on both counts. Uh, I, there are so many questions, but I will go on one which is very simple and very significant. Uh, 1919 will remain in the Egyptian history as an iconic revolution and does not uh, create much con controversy like others. Was this related to the fact that it did not engage in social change or economic restructuring and remained with a, a well-defined uh, objective which was able to get all elements of the nation together? That's a fascinating a question. In many respects, I'd say yes, uh, but let me argue that it chose a nationwide goal that people shared, which started with Orabi years before, the issue of independence and nationalism. That was the ideology behind it. Uh, and it was, it had leadership. The political elite were the leaders the conceptualizers, even when they differed, and they differed on a lot of the, 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 the different steps in the dialogues, the discussions with, with the Brits on the conditions for going to the peace conference and so on. So they had the differences. Ultimately, they kept moving with the specific objective of we want independence and we want them to create a national structure for governance thereafter. As they started to deal with the other issues, the social issues and the economic issues. Or, if I may, because they didn't deal enough with them, that's what, where you saw some people building on the, the, the debate about corruption. What was Nasser's, uh, I mean, he did not argue independence. He basically argued social change. In other words, there had not been social change. So, yes, 1919 succeeded because it had a, a clear message on which Egyptians could gather around. But I think it wasn't sustainable because it had to deal with those other issues as well as you move forward. Uh, I think Nasser's goal of social change is a legitimate goal. I don't necessarily share the execution of that. And to achieve social change, you're supposed to create social change at a higher, wider level rather than uh, reduce that, particularly the issue of, again, pluralistic politics. So in many ways, I'd say, yes, that's why it is considered to be, it was considered to be so successful. But I also think that's probably one of the reasons why it ultimately faced, was faced with 1952. Thank you. Mr. Ambassador. Thank you, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nabil, for the well-articulated uh, presentation. Uh, Your Excellency, in all the events that you have mentioned, 19, 19, 1952, 2011, 2013, you haven't mentioned names at all. Is it intentionally or you don't believe in the role of uh, <laughs> leaders or, or, or human 
an engineer or... Uh, are you going to mention some names? No, thank David. you so much. <laughs> uh, again, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, you correctly read what's on my mind. Uh, if I read to you my comments here, you'd find all the names. Uh, that being said, I actually think the issues are larger than the names. So I said the liberal political elite, but I did not name them because there are the leaders that are known and there are many, many others who played a role in the polity, which is a bit different from the politics. So I intentionally did not mention uh, names from the beginning to the very end. But having been a practitioner, mostly in diplomacy, but in other things as well, people do make a difference. Leaders do make a difference. So I wasn't belittling uh, any particular leader in any of this, but I was just making the point that the issues are a bit larger than, than, than the leaders, and I did not want to make the mistake of not pre uh, preserving the proper balance between different leaders. But it's, it's an excellent point. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I will start really, take somebody from behind, and then this lady, uh, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you. My name is John McHugo. Um, following on from the point about big names, um, I think one of the difficulties in Egyptian politics after 1919 was the big personalities who were behind political parties and all that went with that, even if they were liberals in their beliefs. I mean, I, I understand that Saad Zaghloul, towards the end of his life, considered parliamentarians who opposed him almost to be traitors to Egypt. He came to identify himself to an extent with the nation. You can certainly see that in Gamal Abdel Nasser and then Anwar Sadat and Hosni Mubarak followed in Nasser's shoes, possibly because a structure had been erected for them to do so. Perhaps you can see the same with Sisi today. I'd just like your comments on that. Do you think that perhaps one of the reasons why a political culture of uh, participation, a liberal political culture, didn't um, establish itself in Egypt, as you said at the beginning of your talk, um, do you think that was to some extent con connected with the emergence of big dominating personalities, which of course may have been inevitable given the stage of history? Thank you. Well, it's, it's sort of, or the answer to that, I can either address it by saying I agree with both sides of that argument, or I can say that uh, it, the reason for the problem though, are both points you're making. My, my, as the essence of my response, or my belief at least, is you will need leaders to accentuate and implement big events. Uh, and if you look at 1919, 1952, irrespective of what one felt, they had leaders. Therefore, they were able to create change. If you look at 2011, a very inspiring, and if you, want, if you were in Egypt at the time, very emotional societal event, but in the absence of leaders, it, it was not able among other reasons, it was not able to transform itself into um, a structural, a, a process of structural change. Now, of course, uh, if you don't have pluralistic political culture, then a big ego becomes a problem. Uh, if you do, then it's bound by, okay, you can push the limits of it. And that's why I would argue that I think that one of the best achievements of 1919, I said the best one was the national identity, but the second best one, which is actually part of the identity, was the Constitution. The Constitution, and it wasn't perfect. It established rules of the game that allowed the process to evolve for a number of years before you got the frictions with the king and so on and so forth. So, whether you have big, lead, or big egos, big leaders or not, if you have a solid constitution, 
that helps contain everything. So you have leadership, which is positive dimension, and you also have the rules of the game. Now, there are there is a unique case where you actually don't have, at least in written form, a constitution right here. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, this lady. But the is, uh, culture is there, sorry. and therefore, the culture is there for the practices are respected. Thank you. Thank you, this lady, and I will allow for one more question from this young man, and then we'll break down because I've been told uh, to keep to time. Please. Um, um, my name. Uh, my name is Elahe Mohtasham. I'm a British Iranian academic working in London. First, thank you so much for covering such a span of time um, and enlightening us. Um, it was very interesting for me to, um, to see that as a former foreign um, minister of Egypt, you haven't, um, in your um, excellent talk, talk about the role of foreign um, uh, elements. Is it because you really don't think they had such a um, uh, or, or, or any major influence or um, are there any other considerations? Thank you so much. Thank you. Again, I did I mean, this is a very educated audience by the way. <laughs> uh, I did make a passing reference that the, of the British role and the effects regionally and internationally. But you're right. I intentionally did not focus on the foreign dimension, personally for two reasons. I'm Egyptian. This is Egypt's story. It's our success, our failures, and I truly believe that foreign powers can help and they can be detrimental. But if we do things properly, yeah. that's what it's the governing context. Of it. Secondly, I, you know, excuse my, my, uh, my candidness, and I say this respectfully, the easiest thing in the world is to, to blame a foreigner. Okay, we've done it. Does it solve anything? So anybody who wants the blame can have it, but I'm more focused on the Egyptian role, and that's where I am. Thank you very much. I, I just allow this young man, and that will close the session. Hello, thank you very much. My name is Sharif Abul Hadid. Uh, I'm not actually, I don't come from a political background. I come from biological sciences background. So I have a, a very simple question. So uh, you draw a comparison between the political achievements of 2011 and 1990. And I've seen some from the generation that actually that witnessed and uh, uh, 2011. I have a, a very simple question. Do you think that actually that maybe the political failures are due to the lack of education? Because, for example, uh, when I was back uh, in Egypt studying, we didn't actually, like in class, we didn't get to know in depth what happened in uh, uh, 1919 and all the other political movements. And we didn't even scrutinize all the political movements that happened back then. So that's why when we actually, when we started to do a political movements of our own, maybe you can say we were quite like uh, novice in a kind of way and very innocent as well. So I would like to hear your comment on this. Thank you. Um, again, my focus really throughout the talk was the implications of 1919 on everything else. It wasn't a comparison per se of 19, 19 to 52 and 11 and 13. But your point is valid. If you look at 1919 and 2011, they both had a very important focus. They wanted a different practices governed by the Constitution. What did 1919 do after the independence? Immediately was the Constitution. What were the 2011 movements pushing? It, they were pushing better uh, police practices, and then they wanted revisions to the Constitution to ensure that they had a role in the future. But I would also add, you're confirming the point I'm making, part of establishing a pluralistic political culture is an understanding of history, understanding of how these systems work, and then a period of congestion where you actually practice these. Because believe me, from your age to my age, I've made thousands of mistakes. And I only made them because I tried. And if you don't get the chance to make them, you're not going to be able to succeed. So uh, I may not have been elaborate enough, but yes, 
uh, when I meant culture, I meant including the lack of, of uh, education, particularly in, in politics. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much for a fantastic topic, and thank you, Nabil, and thank you for being a fantastic audience who really holds to the heart and the spirit of the topics today given by Nabil. And uh, we're going for tea or something? You, you take it from there, Noel. Thank you, Nabil.